All right, hello everyone and welcome all. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Lubna Hassan Hekel and I'm a policy program manager here at MPAC. So thank you for joining us in our final installment of our democracy forums. This journey started in DC earlier this year, and we have been able to successfully host these discussions in Chicago, Sacramento, Atlanta, and we're honored to have the forums end here in Houston, where much of the nation will be tuning in for the election results this upcoming November. So our goal for these forums was to execute five thoughtful discussions on the challenges, vulnerabilities, and values of American democracy. And we feel that today's discussion, America's Midterm Crisis, Defending Democracy at the Ballot Box, will be the discussion that brings all these forums together and hopefully motivate all Americans to head to the polls this upcoming November. If you're interested in viewing our past forums, we'll have them in our social media um, for MPAC. And for our online viewers, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we can pass them on to our panelists throughout the program. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to our MPAC president who needs no introduction, Salam El Mirati, who will be moderating this evening's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lubna. Thank you everybody for joining us on uh, this very important topic of democracy and how elections are being affected uh, uh, in this upcoming election uh, in, in November and the future of democracy. Um, so we welcome you to the forums at MPAC. The Muslim Public Affairs Council is an organization aimed at impacting public policy and public opinion involving Islam and Muslims. We are honored to be here today with our renowned panelists. We will be discussing the implications of this year's midterm cycle in protecting America's democracy. Um, and, and really what we feel is important for us as American Muslims is usually people think that all we talk about is Islamophobia and discrimination and the hijab and the beard and, and so on and so forth. What we're saying is that American Muslims are as concerned about democracy, if not more so than um, uh, our fellow Americans. We know too well how tyranny takes hold uh, in various countries. That's what happened in the Middle East um, and, and parts of South Asia in many Muslim majority countries. Now we see Islamic states that are denying the right of women to choose how they, how they dress using morality police. So this is a, an affront to both religion and democracy. And therefore our interest in protecting democracy is, is for our own. In other words, it is in the self-interest of all Americans to protect our democracy, including American Muslims. That's why we're involved in this issue, uh, to work uh, on, on this issue with fellow Americans. So we've, We've seen in terms of this upcoming elections, the impact uh, of 126 bills in 28 states that affect absentee voting, registration policies, polling stations, and ID requirements. These measures disproportionately affect people of color and limit the options citizens use to exercise their right to vote. At MPAC, we believe political engagement among all stakeholders serves as a pertinent tool in protecting democracy. Joining us today is Texas State Representative Ron Reynolds, Texas County Attorney Christian Menefee, and former Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins. As public servants, Representative Re Re Reynolds, Menefee, and Hollins all championed the right to vote by testifying for the John Lewis Voting Right Act. And John Lewis sacrificed his life for our freedom and for our democracy today. And we're proud to be standing on his shoulders in defending people's right to vote in America. Um, many of these bills oppose, uh, many of, of, of these initiatives that we're talking about today um, are introducing drive-through voting. Uh, and today uh, our speakers will engage in discourse about their activities during the last cycle to defend voting rights, such as addressing inequitable access to ballot boxes. First is Representative Ron Reynolds, Texas State Representative uh, for the 27th District. Representative Re Reynolds was sworn in on January 10th, 2011 as State Representative, House District 27. He is currently serving his sixth term in the Texas House 
and is the first African-American state representative in Fort Bend County since Reconstruction. Representative Reynolds was named 2021 87th Session Legislator of the Year by both Fort Bend United and the Young and the Politics. He served as the House Minority Whip during the 83rd and 84th Legislative Sessions and currently is the second Vice Chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. Rep Representative Reynolds serves as on the House Committee Environmental Regulation and Defense and Veterans Affairs Committee. In addition, Representative Reynolds helped lead the Texas legislative Democratic leaders to DC to testify for Congress to pass both the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Representative Reynolds, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, what is impacting our voting rights, especially the big lie that uh, the election was was stolen uh, in 2020, um, and how this has driven to introduce pre-filed and carried over 250 voter uh, suppression laws in 27 states. Um, several of these measures include voter ID requirements, proof of citizenship, and mail-in ballot bans. What do you believe the most concerning aspect uh, of this rhetoric is in relation to recent attempts at voter suppression, and how does that add importance to this year's midterm election? So if you can address some of these points. Sure, sure. Point. First of all, good evening. It's great to be here. I want to thank Impact for assembling this much needed conversation and allow me to join such distinguished guests as our county attorney in Harris County, Christian Menifee, and a great, great leader uh, for our democracy and Chris Holland. So uh, I, I want to say I'm very thankful for your introduction, and I'm, I'm very excited to announce that I'm now chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus and also chair of the Texas Progressive Caucus. I was the founder. Uh, and so what's at stake is the most precious fundamental right that we have in America is our, is our right to vote. That is the bedrock of our democracy. And we thought because of John Lewis making good and necessary trouble and other civil rights leaders, people of good conscience all over this country, they literally died, marched and advocated so that we could eliminate voter suppression in this country. This country has a dark history of voter suppression and Jim Crow laws that prohibited people of color from voting. They instituted poll taxes and literacy tests. People had to do such unfathomable things as guess how many bubbles in a bar of soap. They had to recite constitutions. They had to do things that they shouldn't have had to do if they were black or if they were brown or certainly if they were women at a certain point in time in the country before the passage of the 19th Amendment, they couldn't vote. But thankfully, we passed the John Lewis, I mean, we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which supposedly eliminated that. That allowed me, as you, as you rightfully said in your introduction, to be the first African-American state representative in Fort Bend County since Reconstruction, because there were barriers that prevented people of my hue from voting and, 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 and holding public office. So mm -hmm. we come, we've come a long way, but you usher in the MAGA movement under the big lie from Donald Trump of, of him losing the election because it was stolen because of voter, massive voter fraud and these, these ballots that shouldn't have been cast and dead people voting and people illegally voting and all this nonsense. It was vetted by his, uh, by the courts and many of the same Republican judges that he appointed into off office. And they saw that there was absolutely no merit to it. Such even such that Rudy Giuliani uh, is, is, is facing disbarment in New York and other places. His people who espouse those same lies are being disbarred. People who espouse those lies are being sued for defamation. There's no merit. So the courts struck it all down. Ultimately, Joe Biden was elected president. Kamala Harris was elected a president because of a record turnout. People of, of, of all races, voting to uh, uh, bring him into office. And now we have, because of that big lie, states like Texas and other states that have ushered in voter suppression laws, Jim Crow 2.0 is what we're calling them, the likes of we hadn't seen since the 1960s. 
in the dark days of this country. They want to win by any means necessary. They want to win by subtraction. And what do I mean by that? They want to win by keeping people who are more likely to vote Democrat, African-Americans, Hispanics, Muslims, Asians, young people, seniors. They want to make it more difficult for them to vote. And many of the things that worked that Chris Hollis instituted uh, in Harris County, drive through voting, mobile voting, things that work 24-hour voting in a pandemic, they want to eliminate them. They want to make it harder to vote and easier to purchase guns. They want to mm. make it harder to vote. Uh, and, and, and they want to stifle our democracy. So what's at stake in our midterm is that you have a, unfortunately, Republican legislatures have passed these draconian measures and they implemented these laws to make it more difficult. They're putting more barriers so that people have uh, strict voter ID requirements, so that people have uh, uh, don't have access to the ballot. And so I'm urging people of good conscience to pass the voting, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The Senate, the, the House did their job. They passed it. We 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 fled Texas to avoid a quorum so they couldn't pass it. And so we could go to DC to advocate for passage of it. And I'm thankful to Speaker Pelosi and the Congressional Black Caucus and those leaders that stood courageously and championed that and they passed it. And it died in the Senate because of the filibuster and no Republicans supporting it. When the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or when the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized it, under, under former President George Bush, it passed the Senate 98 to nothing, 98 to nothing. And now you can't get one Republican to support it. And so I'm asking people of good conscience that believe in our democracy, that believe in protecting the sacred fundamental right to vote, to make sure that they exercise the right to vote this midterm so that we can vote out those obstructionists in the U.S. Senate that are trying to keep people that look like me that 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 may be Muslim, that may be people of color. They want to they, they want to keep them from voting. They need to be voted out of office because that is unconscionable. That you can raise your hand to swear an oath to protect the Constitution, and you want to suppress people's sacred right to vote. That people die for. I stand on their shoulders today, and lo and behold, I'm going to keep fighting to preserve and protect our democracy. Thank you so much, Representative Reynolds, for those eloquent words. And I'll have to remember that line is that they're trying to make it easier to purchase guns than uh, actually uh, defending the right to vote. That's right. That's sad. That's sad, but it's, it's so true. It's true. I'm, I'm just going to be very transparent today with, with yeah. the listeners because there's so much at stake. I don't want to give people uh, platitudes. I want to be very transparent and real, and that is what our democracy is at stake. They want to take us backwards to dark days. That is what the MAGA movement is all about. It's about pr promulgating lies that they can't substantiate it from unfounded claims of voter fraud. And this is a solution in search of a problem. Voter fraud was was struck down as, as false and fake news to use his own words. And that there, there there's no reason that we're doing this other than to suppress people's blood ball because people die for it right to vote thank you it's un-american it's unpatriotic absolutely thank you um now we turn to um christian menifee harris county attorney uh, in texas as the harris county attorney christian menifee is the chief civil lawyer for the largest county in texas elected in 2020 he manages an office of 250 plus attorneys and staff who represent the county it's 60 elected officials, and it's 18,000 plus employees in all civil matters and lawsuits. He is the youngest person and the first African-American to serve as Harris County attorney. In private practice, Christian also focused on pro bono work, including advi advising the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, advising immigrants and their family families at Bush Intercontinental Airport during the Muslim ban, and working with Texas Appleseed on expanding alternatives to involuntary commitment for the mentally ill. His office has been on the front lines of defending voting rights in Texas. We welcome Mr. Menifee to our discussion today and thank him for his contributions to civil rights. Mr. Menifee. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I, I'll be brief and, and kind of attack this uh, from the legal angle. 
Um, throughout our country over the past almost a decade, we've seen an undoing of the important voting rights protections that had existed uh, in our country for decades prior. And really this all started back in 2013 when the United States Supreme Court ruled in a case called Holder v. Shelby County. Now, what was important about that was uh, since the Voting Rights Act was first passed, it put in place many important protections uh, that were aimed specifically at protecting minority voters in Southern states. Uh, these are states that had a history of outright violence uh, when, when Black folks tried to vote and, and other minorities, and also uh, many mechanisms that were put in place to stop them from having full access to the ballot box that were less pernicious, but still had the same effect, right? Um, Representative Reynolds talked about uh, poll taxes, uh, in, in the tests, the poll tests that had to be taken and other types of uh, machinations that were put in place by leaders throughout the South. And so one of the ways that the Voting Rights Act protected people uh, from their own states was by putting in place a preclearance requirement. Effectively, if any of these states wanted to go in and change a voting process, they had to get permission before they did so from either the Attorney General of the United States or a three-judge panel. And it was important because it provided a direct connection between those marginalized communities and the federal government, um, which represented uh, a more progressive view on voting uh, than many of these states. But in this lawsuit in 2013, the United States Supreme Court got rid of that preclearance requirement, and that opened up the door for states uh, across the country, but particularly here in the South, to start passing voting rules that were illegal for decades prior. So one good example is here in the state of Texas, that's around the time that we got our voter ID law. Uh, voter ID laws are, are one of the most subtle ways uh, that folks of a certain party have put in place barriers to keep certain people from participating in political processes. Well, after this case came out, Texas then passed its voter ID law, and ultimately there were a bunch of lawsuits filed. And for the most part, the rule was gutted, but uh, it still exists in some form to this day. Well, many people would think, oh, well, voter ID laws, is just common sense, right? Uh, how is that stopping people uh, from participating in the democratic process? And the answer is that there are certain communities that don't have the same access to go and be able to get the certain mandated IDs as more affluent communities. But you would think that something like that had been in place for centuries. But the truth is, here in the state of Texas, it was just recently that the enhanced rule was put into place. And we saw those types of rules uh, being passed uh, throughout the country. And in fact, in, in one state, North Carolina, um, a, a certain party took over uh, every level of the state government and, and passed laws that, although they uh, looked good on the surface, they had a cloak of racism. Uh, and these this included getting rid of same-day registration, requiring people to vote only in certain precincts, um, and, and other mechanisms that were put in place uh, based on certain data that the state government had used to show that it would cause Black people to vote less. And when the lawsuits in those cases were filed, it was thrown out in court. And one of the important things that the judges in those cases said was that uh, these lawmakers had targeted African-Americans with almost surgical precision. So this is a, a thing that has been going on throughout the country. Um, but more recently, for the past decade, it's been a targeted attack uh, on these certain communities. And so all of this was already going on from 2013 uh, to the few subsequent years after that. And then what we saw was when former President Trump claimed that the 2020 election was stolen, you saw a heightened effort by these states to pass even more regressive laws. And it was particularly in the South. So states like Georgia, Florida, and of course, Texas uh, started passing additional laws to make it even harder to vote. And so what my office does is we're the civil lawyers for Harris County. It's the largest county in Texas. If it were a, a state, it'd be uh, the 25th most populous state. And what we do is we file lawsuits against the state of Texas uh, to try to undermine them when they are seeking to restrict the right to vote. So the best example is Senate Bill 1. Uh, right after former President Trump uh, called for these types of laws to be passed uh, throughout the country, Texas volunteer to be one of the first up. And they passed uh, SB1, which in large part undermined the work that County Clerk Chris Hollins did um, during the 2020 election. It ended drive through voting. It ended 24-hour voting. It placed a, a number of other restrictions on uh, voting by mail, um, on uh, restricted access for certain um, differently abled folks to the polling sites. 
And so we fought a lawsuit against the state of Texas uh, over that law um, for the main reason that one important thing that that law did was it made it a crime for elections officials to solicit folks to vote by mail. It's really interesting because candidates, including former President Trump, routinely solicit people to vote for them by mail. In fact, it's an important part of campaigning and of our political process. And uh, as long as that's been in place, nobody's ever had any issues with it. Uh, but Texas thought it best to pass a law that elections officials who were encouraging folks to exercise their right to vote by mail, not even encouraging them to vote for a specific candidate, uh, could be penalized criminally. And so we we sued the state of Texas, uh, hoping to to rein in those criminal penalties. And although we got some early victories in the case, it's it currently went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the appellate court for the Texas area, and, and it's a battle that's still ongoing, right? Um, but here in Texas, there's been no shortage of measures that have been put in place to keep people from exercising their right to vote. And what we saw was that when SB1 passed, uh, our rejection rates for mail ballot applications went through the roof because under the previous system, uh, you would just put, if you were applying to vote by mail on the application, you would either put your driver's license number or your social security number. And uh, regardless of which number the state had, as long as those numbers were public information, you would receive your application to vote by mail. Um, however, under the current system, the number that you put has to be the exact same number that is in the system for you, which nine times out of 10 is the number that you use when you originally registered to vote. And so if you registered to vote for the first time 20 years ago, you don't know which of those two numbers is in there. You put the wrong number, your application could be rejected. So uh, these are minor underhanded ways of impacting large numbers of voters that the state of Texas has continued to put in place. And so the commitment from my office is that we're going to keep filing these lawsuits. Uh, we'll continue to drag our governor and our attorney general uh, into court uh, to ensure that we're doing everything we can to make the ballot box and the political process as accessible to as many eligible voters as possible. Uh, it shouldn't be about politicians picking the groups of folks that they want to vote. It shouldn't be about politicians picking the, the group of folks that they want to participate in the process. Everybody should have fair and equal access. And, and so that's why we file our lawsuits and that's why we continue these fights in the courts. Thank you. And, and you know, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Menifee, the, the legal process and some people feel like they have lost confidence in the legal system. But I think it's important to understand there still are measures that we can take uh, to defend the voting rights of people, and, and they should be taken. That's and right. I, I think the best thing uh, that we could possibly do is get voting rights protections enshrined uh, through the federal government, right, through federal legislation that is passed by both houses of Congress and, and, and signed by the president. Uh, short of that, your best alternative avenue is, is in the courtrooms uh, across the country. And because we've seen a slew of, shall we say, conservative judges that have been appointed to the bench, it has become increasingly more difficult to get favorable rulings um, arguing under the Voting Rights Act or under uh, constitutional provisions. And so it's a fight that is absolutely necessary. Uh, it's a fight that must be done to ensure that we leave no stone unturned. But our, our best case scenario uh, is to get the federal government to intervene and to say, look, the right to vote, the right to participate in our democratic process, what could be more germane to the American experience than that? And so we're going to protect this uh, equally across the states instead of the piecemeal deal that we have now where you know you may live in, in a certain state in the Midwest or in the North and you have a robust opportunity to cast your ballot and to register um, or to vote by mail. Or you may you know live in the South and there's some very strict rules uh, and it's increasingly more difficult uh, to cast your ballot. Uh, I, I believe we need federal intervention on this matter and we need it uh, equally across the United States. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next, we turn to Chris Hollins, former county clerk of Harris County in Texas. Chris uh, Hollins led the 2020 elections effort in Harris County as county clerk and gained national acclaim for protecting and expanding voting rights for 2.5 mil million Houston area voters during the most important election thus far. His innovations, which included drive-through voting, 24-hour voting, online mail ballot tracking, and tripling the number of early voting centers, led to remarkable record voter turnout despite the global pandemic. Notably, Mr. Hollins is running for Houston mayor in 2023. We welcome Mr. Hollins. Thank you so much 
for joining us today. Absolutely. Uh, no, it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. Uh, and again, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Rev. Ron Reynolds, congratulations on, uh, on your new chairmanship and, and County Attorney Christian Menifee, a dear friend of mine who's been doing incredible work uh, since he took office uh, last year. Um, look, these guys covered a lot of the bases. Um, Representative Reynolds, you know, after the 2020 election, when he returned uh, to the state house, uh, was was key in in the fight, which which Democrats you know fought as as long and as hard as they could, uh, even taking the fight up to Washington D.C. to try to protect our rights. But you know, my service as, as, as county clerk was one in which it was my job simply to protect the right to vote, to make sure that people could vote in a simple and straightforward manner and that we give them the peace of mind that their vote was gonna be counted. And so you've already covered some of the things that we did during that time, right? Uh, Drive-through voting where anybody who wanted to could cast a ballot from the safety and convenience of their vehicles. 24 hour voting where doctors and nurses, uh, first responders, essential workers, uh, folks like grocery store workers who were stocking shelves till two and three in the morning. We just gave them one night on which they could cast a ballot at a time that was convenient for them. Uh, we made it simpler for uh, our seniors to understand the vote by mail process uh, and then ultimately to, to cast their ballots by mail and then to know that their ballots made it to us through online tracking. So in the same way that you can you know, track your Amazon package to your house, you can ensure that your vote made it to us and that it was counted. And so you know, we, were, we were proud of, of that effort. Uh, and, and as Representative Reynolds stated, you know, that effort was not in service to, to one party or the other, or to one race or the other, or one gender or the other. It didn't matter who you were going to vote for. It didn't matter what part of town you lived in. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor. It didn't matter what your religion was, uh, whether you were gay, straight, or, or anything else. If you were here in Harris County in 2020 and you were a citizen and you were registered to vote, uh, we gave you every opportunity to do so and to do so safely. Um, and that should be how democracy works. Like we, we have to remind ourselves when we have this conversation that we have the, the constitutional right to vote. This is not a privilege. Um, this is something that as a citizen is either a birthright or something that you've earned uh, by immigrating to this country and doing the hard work of, of becoming a citizen in the United States. And from there, when you have that right, we should make that right simple to exercise, right? And you, you've you seen, you know, so many other, I mean, look, we live in, it's, it's 2022, right? We bank, you know, on our devices, right? We pick up controlled substances at pharmacies in drive-throughs. Right. And, and, but there's so much fear about a way that we could possibly vote securely. Um, although we're hearing from the Department of, of Homeland Security uh, at the federal level that 2020 was the most secure election in the history of the United States. Well, go figure. Of course it was, uh, because we have so many, um, you know, measures in place to ensure that. You know, we have bipartisan work happening at every single voting center in, you know, in every, really every voting center in the country, right? You have Republicans and Democrats who are there working together, keeping an eye out, ultimately solving problems together to try and make it, again, easier for their neighbors to participate. Um, and that's what the county clerk's office did in 2020. Um, since then, we've, we've uh, gone even further into being nonpartisan by creating the position of the, the, the election administrator. Uh, in Harris County, which is the same thing that pretty much every other uh, major county in the state of Texas has. Um, and all those things, where you vote, how you vote, how those votes get counted, are monitored by people from, from both parties. And that's how it should be, right? Uh, to give everyone that, that peace of mind, but to carry on um, you know, this lie that is then ultimately used to make it harder for certain populations to vote, and those include uh, racial and ethnic minority, religious minorities, 
and 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 so many others who often find themselves them, them, themselves marginalized in this country is a big problem. And so we should be fighting as hard as we can to to do the exact opposite of what the law in Texas has done recently. Uh, when we have a right, we should be fighting to make sure that the folks who have that right are able to exercise it, um, that we're given that this right is so important and so critical to the future of our communities and our countries, that we're working to educate people on the importance of the vote and the importance of what's on their ballot. Um, and the folks like Ron Reynolds, like Christian Menefee, and now like Chris Hollins, who are running for these offices and what they stand for um, and what they'll bring so that people can participate in a way that goes beyond party affiliation, goes beyond um, you know, what they're seeing in advertisements on television or on, on the internet, and, and it allows them to choose leadership for themselves, for their communities uh, that aligns with their values and, and that they know is, is going to bat for them and their families every day. And so um, in addition to you know, now seeking the office of mayor in the city of Houston, I've, I've continued to be on the front lines of this battle um, trying to get as many people as possible involved, faith communities, business communities, anyone, frankly, who will answer um, and who has you know, resources and a network, we're trying to bring them into this fight for democracy because we cannot take democracy for granted. We, we just last year you know, had a violent attack on the United States Capitol. Um, since then, uh, one political party you know, has stood behind uh, the assailants in that attack yeah. and uh, has continued to put these measures in place that are weakening the free and fair elections that ultimately make this a free country. And we need to be standing together uh, to combat that in every way that we possibly can. And to Christian's previous point, um, th the feeling is that federal intervention is, is what's necessary at this point. That's uh, that's interesting. I I just want to make a comment. If I could step back for a second, you know, in terms of this big lie and the election was stolen, I think that Al Gore probably had a more solid case of having the election taken away from him than uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and it's not to say that Al Gore didn't do the right thing. He did the right thing. There was a supreme. It, it got to a supreme court uh, in terms of the elections in Florida that allowed certain ballots to go. And while, uh, you know, at, at first, Florida in 2000 was considered his state, he had won, it turned out after recounts and, you know, all the chat, what's it called, the chads and all Hang that, chads. Hanging <laughs> chads and all that debate, it turned out they gave it to uh, George Bush uh, Jr. So, um, but he didn't, he didn't say, oh, the, the election was stolen from me. He conceded because he believed, and I'm not saying this because he's a Democrat, he said, he, he, he conceded because he believed in the, the democratic process, the institution, the institutional work of democracy, that we are committed to a peaceful transition, especially when we lose. Uh, and I think that is the litmus test for our democracies, is to have uh, every candidate commit to uh, accepting the results, win or lose, do you all believe that that's, that's important or uh, that's a non-starter for the other side, the, the, the Republican parties in, in Texas? So I'll give you a good example. I, I think that it's, it's spreading um, from the federal politicians, uh, you know, the, the President Trumps of the world, to more local elected officials, and it's now impacting local elections. So just here in Harris County, um, in our last election cycle, uh, we had a member of our governing body who voted not to certify the results of a certain election. And it was for some hyper-technical, uh, nonsensical reason. Uh, but it was the first time that we had seen that out here, right? Effectively politicizing the, the process of accepting the election results. And now we have a candidate who's, who's running for one of the members of our governing body. Um, she's running for one of those positions. And one thing she said is, 
uh, hey, I don't like that you all have this nonpartisan elected uh, uh, elections administrator. Instead, I, I would like to return the elections back to the way that they used to be. And if things go back to the way that they used to be, then I will vote to certify, you know, any election. Well, of course, implicit in that is the idea that if things, if the current election process stays the same way it is, you won't certify. Uh, so I think that there's a trickle down effect that's happening. Um, it's no longer just a national narrative that, you know, has senators or Congress people pushing back against the legitimacy of elections. You're now starting to see it in, in local offices as well, uh, which is a scary thing. And I think um, is is a hallmark of the fact that it's it's a fight that's going to continue over the next several election cycles. It's not something that you know came and went because President Trump lost re-election. Instead, I think it's something we can expect to become more mainstream here in the near future. Thank you. And and just to be fair, I, I think Richard Nixon, even though he was guilty of what happened in Watergate, um, also committed to to democracy by actually ag agreeing to leave. He left, uh, and uh, even though uh, he maintained this notion, you know, I'm not a crook, and when he said that, everybody believed he was a crook. But regardless, he was committed to the democratic institution. So, so it's it's a Republican, and when he lost to John F. Kennedy in 1960, same thing. It was a very close race, but he conceded uh, after it was clear that Kennedy had won by the slimmest of margins. And I think it's that commitment to democracy that we need to be talking about. Is there a possibility there in Texas? We're, we're, we're looking at Texas from the outside here at MPAC. You are all there. Is there a possibility of a bipartisan effort for this commitment to uh, the democratic process that we are talking about today? I, I really, in a, in a perfect world, it would be a bipartisan. It would be because this is such a fundamental right as Christian County Attorney Christian Menifee stated, it doesn't matter, you know, these, well, actually it was Chris Holland talking about, these rules apply to Democrats and Republicans. Voting is a fundamental right. It doesn't matter if you're black, right, which poor, you know, you, you're, as long as you're a citizen, it applies to everybody. So you would think that this is something that should be bipartisan in nature. If nothing else is bipartisan, voting rights should be bipartisan, right? It, it's the bedrock and foundation of our democracy. But the answer is no. They've made it a litmus test. If you don't believe in uh, uh, of, of voter suppression, then we will vote you out. They, they, they've made that a litmus test. If you certify the election results, then they would primary you. There are many US senators that did the right thing. They're gone or uh, they're on their way out. Look what they did to Liz Cheney. And so it is not about what is best for our country, putting America first and doing following the constitution and follow the law and, and, and making sure that we preserve and protect the fundamental precious right to vote. It is winning by any means necessary. And that it means that we have to trounce on the voting rights that have been uh, embedded and that, that, that the bedrock of our democracy, so be it. That means that we will do it. And that is unfortunately the reason why we can't get bipartisan support. No one is willing to do the right thing when unfortunately before they were ready to do it. Now they're saying, well, even privately, some of my colleagues said, Reynolds, I, I know this is the right thing to do, but if I do it, I'm gonna get primary and I, I wanna get reelected. So I can't be with you on this one. And that's what they're saying privately. You know, in, in response to the 2020 elections at the federal level, Senators Joe Manchin and Susan Collins introduced the Electoral Count Reform Act in this August of this year to further define the process of confirming election results. Several important measures include appointing the governor to certify state electors and raising the threshold for congressional objections. How effective do you think these policies would be in retroactively stopping bad faith actors from claiming election fraud in future election cycles? Are there improvements you're hoping to see in the final bill? Would anyone like to take that question? Okay, or just more broadly, um, you know, is, is there anything that you feel that is happening at the federal level that we need to utilize in, in terms of certifying election results in 2022? I know you guys have, have talked about uh, federal uh, uh, efforts to sure. leverage. You want to no, it's, it's a that? good question. Uh, I think, you know, I think my pause, uh, is is based on 
you know, having been in this fight for a while now and, and seeing the writing on the wall that even, um, you know, Representative Reynolds mentioned the fact that folks like Liz Cheney get ostracized and ultimately pushed out of their parties. Um, you know, we have we have 50 Republican United States senators, every single one of them that refuses to even come to the table uh, to talk about, you know, basics of protecting democracy, right? And so, you know, preclearance is something that that Menifee mentioned a moment ago that we should have. Right, and that was not controversial just a few years ago, but in this instance, what's necessary, and Ted Cruz has already spoken up against it, uh, is simply to ensure that when these votes take place um, at the state level, when they're certified, when they come to D.C., that it's that it's the folks' job in Congress just to just to simply tally them. Right, it's a ceremonial uh, effort to ultimately you know, designate the next president and promote the peaceful transfer of power regardless of who wins. But the opposite is what's taking place. You have Republicans running for office across this country and the entirety of their platform in some cases is that if they're in a position of power like Secretary of State, that they will stand in the way of certifying elections when their favorite candidate doesn't win. Um, we have no one in the Republican legislature, um, besides Liz Cheney, who was just voted out, Adam Kinzinger, who retired because he knew he couldn't win, yeah. um, who were saying that that is wrong, right? And I'll give you something that ha just happened this past weekend. Uh, I, I imagine both of these brothers were at the Texas Tribune Fest, which is you know a big uh, event each year in Austin, where politics is is key to the conversation, and our um, our Speaker of the House stated that the 2020 election was not stolen, right? And the fact that that was a newsworthy statement, you know, two years after the election, and that people were patting him on his back for his bravery and speaking truth to power, it's like, what kind of world are we living in here? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, folks will will get on you know, these grandstands and talk about the need for both sides to come together and so on. But in this situation, one side is standing firmly with the fact that we should have free and fair elections and that whoever the people choose should win. And then there's another side that's saying something that's different from that. Uh, and that's a huge problem. And that's not a both sides problem. Uh, and so, you know, pardon me for being a little bit pessimistic here, but you know, there is not good faith at the federal level, at the state level, uh, coming from the Republican Party in terms of supporting and ensuring that democracy continues to exist and thrive in this country. Yeah, I, I want to ask you also about another concern, and that is gerrymandering. Um, you know, for several decades, partisan gerrymandering has been a major issue of concern for federal elections. Currently, the Supreme Court is hearing the case Moore versus Hopper, Harper which will decide whether the North Carolina Supreme Court can strike down gerrymandered congressional maps relating to federal elections. At a deeper level, however, the case will also be ruling on the independent state legislature theory, a debunked interpretation of the elections clause that would grant state legislators near exclusive authority to regulate federal elections. How concerned would you be for the state of Texas if the Supreme Court were to accept the independent state legislature theory in its ruling? Incredibly concerned. And in fact, uh, we've already seen what our state legislator, uh, at least the folks in the majority, are capable of with our federal elections when left to their own devices. Uh, during our, our last legislative session, which included redistricting, uh, we saw in the state of Texas an increase in, in the number of voters. And of course, that was disproportionately borne by minority voters. Um, and minority residents, yet uh, you didn't see an increase in the number of congressional seats that were drawn into these communities. Instead, they were drawn in communities that were predominantly white. And in fact, in the early drafts of the old redistricting proposal, uh, members of, uh, of the Texas House um, and certain statewide uh, elected officials saw to it to try to combine two historically African-American seats here in the Houston area, uh, one of which has been around for decades and, and was held 
uh, by highly esteemed Congress folks uh, such as Mickey Leland and Barbara Jordan, tried to force them uh, into the same district, really, you know, it, effectively giving a middle finger <laughs> to African Americans um, uh, in the Houston area. Uh, so I, I would be highly concerned um, to see the Supreme Court move in that direction uh, and allow the state legislator in the state of Texas to be left to its own devices. And that's just one of the many important questions that are going to be before the the uh, United States Supreme Court here in the next term. I mean, we have uh, affirmative action issues, uh, a host of issues that are largely going to impact um, how racial disparities are viewed in this country. And on the issue of voting, um, I would be highly disappointed, but it, it would really be par for the course for this Supreme Court uh, that has, over the past several sessions, walked back the Voting Rights Act and, and allowed states to put in place restrictions. So uh, fingers crossed and and of course, uh, my office will be involved in submitting an amicus brief on those issues, uh, but I'm certainly not optimistic about it. The struggle continues. Um, you know, the uh, in the chat space, I just wanted to uh, turn attention to the op-ed that we wrote uh, in the Chicago Sun-Times that was entitled, Failure to Take Action After January 6th Represents an Existential Threat to America. And one of the key quotes from an American Muslim perspective, the MAGA movement represents people who would rather burn down America than share it with all citizens equally. And I think that's what we're, we're up against. So it's been a bit sobering you know, in this discussion, yet there are always opportunities and uh, signs of hope. I'd like each of you to leave with us one or two things that we can do uh, to reinforce uh, this this effort uh, in terms of being enthusiastic, hopeful, and positive in, 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 in our work, encountering this threat to our de democracy in the current political era. I'll go first, and I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, um, say what you will about the party uh, that is fighting to restrict the right to vote, but one of the things that they did have was foresight, and they understood the importance of, of flipping state legislative bodies uh, and getting power at the state level because they saw that, hey, in 20 years, the fights for all the issues that are important to both sides are really going to be taking place at the states. And so I think one thing that folks can do is, you know, run for state house, run for state senate, support candidates at, at the state level of government uh, that you believe in and that stand for the things that you stand for, uh, because these fights are going to be won and lost uh, primarily at the state level. Um, and the second thing is I try to regularly give money um, to legal organizations that are uh, handling these fights at the highest levels uh, of our judicial branch. Um, and so I would say, you know, research an organization that makes sense to you. But until uh, we see more uh, equity and parity in, in the state legislators across this country, these fights are going to be borne out in the courtrooms. Um, and so, you know, there are a bunch of great organizations that do this work uh, purely as a non on nonprofit status. Of course, a good example is the NAA Legal Defense, NAACP Legal Defense Fund um, that's been around for a long time, has been engaging in these fights. There are a host of other organizations, uh, but to the extent that we're going to continue to have these fights in the courtrooms and they're going to have such a massive impact on so many people throughout this country and on so many voting rules and restrictions, I think it's important to do what you can to support those causes as well. So support legal defense funds and run for office. And I think that you're exactly right, uh, 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 City Attorney Hennessy, that um, County Attorney Hennessy, sorry, that, um, that uh, a lot of this what's happening today is rooted back in the state legislature um, uh, campaigns in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s that, that were really won by the political right. Uh, they, they put the effort and now uh, th th they're controlling much many of our state legislatures. It's time for uh, both sides really to be represented in our state legislators and not to have it so one-sided. So appreciate that insight. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll Mr. state Mullins. the option, uh, vote. You know, what happens in these situations, and it's and it's very intentional, is, you know, you make it, you know, just that much harder and that much harder to vote. You you throw out this much more misinformation, 
you talk about, hey, it doesn't make a difference, right? That I mean, that's explicitly what's coming out in some of these campaigns is, hey, voting make, doesn't make a difference because it's trying to convince folks that it's not worth the hassle, right? Politics is ugly. It's all BS anyway. Look over there, right? And when you look over there, sorry, I think an advertisement just popped up on my- You're, on you're my looking phone. over there. <laughs> and when you look over there, what they're doing over here, right, in the legislature, which you just decided to abstain from deciding, um, is now changing laws that impact you negatively and yep. your family, right, that target you directly for discrimination um, and take away, you know, little by little uh, other rights, right, that the reason why the constitutional right to vote is so important is that it is the baseline of what protects every other right that you have. And so we have to vote. We have to get our friends, family members, and so on to vote. And, and this piece is important as well. You know, there are so many campaigns that spend millions, now even billions of dollars uh, to try to get people to the ballot box. And what's, you know, three, four, five times as effective as somebody knocking on your door or texting you is, is a friend just telling you to vote or a colleague or a family member. Uh, and so we cannot diminish our own ability to have an impact just to get five or 10 more people to the polls who might otherwise just say, oh, I was busy that day, no yeah. worries. Um, and that can, that can really impact uh, our, our lives. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's, it's insisting that those we put in office you know, are actually serving us. And that, that takes a lot more work to stay informed, to pay attention, um, to, to not be discouraged by the ugliness that, that politics has come to embody, um, but, but persist in, in fighting for the rights. And that's why organizations like, like Impact are so critically important because you're, you're keeping your eye on the ball and you're continuing to bring folks uh, you know, from the Muslim community in uh, to engage directly instead of the pressure that you get by default, which is to disengage. So, um, so that's, you know, it's, it's keeping your eyes on that prize, uh, having direct impact when you can by voting or by running for office. Last thing I'll say is serve as an election worker, right? Again, with all this, this, this hubbub about fraud and this and that, the job of the election worker has gotten really, really hard. The job of the election administrator has gotten hard. You see people retiring from this office, changing careers completely because they've been getting death threats and so on. And so the way that we keep the ballot box secure, the way that we ensure that people from our own communities are able to come and vote and do so with a degree of comfort and feeling safe and feeling accepted in that environment is for you to be the election worker that welcomes them in. And it's easy. Um, you do a quick training and then, you know, if you're taking a day and maybe a couple of days off of work to, to do that job, but it's really, really important that we are direct actors in, in this democracy. It's not a spectator sport. Yeah. I, I, and I, I really appreciate your words, uh, Mr. Hollins, that, you know, so often we, we only pay attention to the presidential elections. We don't pay attention down the ballot, you know, not just the state, but also who's in our city government, because it's all connected. And if you don't pay attention to that, that is where the change is, is going to happen, and it will be to your detriment uh, if you, uh, you know, decide to uh, sit out the local and state elections. And I think that's what we're talking about today. It's, that's so, so important. So I appreciate your words, uh, Mr. Hollins. Uh, Representative Reynolds, I'm going to throw you a curveball to end this, uh, and I think you're going to be able to handle it because you, you mentioned that you're now a leader in the Progressive Caucus. And there are two issues that that come out from progressives. Um, and, and part of it is this feeling that, that, yeah, maybe they don't want to burn down our democracy, but they want to dismantle so much uh, for, the, for the cause of social justice that unless we get our way, we want to dismantle the whole apparatus. That in, in, in some ways turns off people, uh, that it's a bit too extreme. How can we, how can we work with the progressive lens, but but also be able to work across the aisle and, and, and with others. Number two, two progressives lost their 
the elections. Uh, Andy Levin, the son of Carl Levin in Michigan, you know, a family that has such a historic legacy in, in, in democratic politics, but he lost because he was a progressive within the Democratic Party. Marie Newman lost in her primary within the Democratic Party. There's something going on in our party that we're not really understanding or connecting uh, with that is, 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 is resulting in the loss of these very imp important progressive voices. If you can speak to those two issues. Sure. sure. The first issue uh, was crystallized when many of the progressives I thought went way too far after the brutal death of George Floyd when they came up with the slogan of defund the police. That mm. was a narrative that really hurt Democrats. I understand their point was we need reforms. Uh, we need to demilitarize the police. We need to make sure that they are, you know, meaningful criminal justice reforms. But when they came out with that slogan, defund the police, it said a narrative that really hurt the cause. And sometimes progressives uh, want all or nothing. And you can't have all or nothing in politics. It is, it is the art of compromise. You have to work across the aisle if you want to get anything meaningful done. Uh, typically, that means that you're not going to get every single thing that you want. And so, you know, when it comes to getting legislation passed, I have to tell progressives all the time, incremental steps, something is better than nothing. The compromise that was made to get uh, some federal gun safety reforms at the federal level were better than nothing. No, we didn't get, you know, raising the age of banning assault rifles, but they were able to get some funding for red flag laws. So you have to take the 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 incremental approach to get to where you want to get. And sometimes it takes several cycles. And that is something that it takes um, many senior members to try to work with these progressives. And I've tried to do that uh, to make sure that they understand don't lose sight on the goal because you want everything all at once or because you're not getting everything that you want. You know, hey, I want a $15 minimum wage, but if we could get to do a sliding scale of 12, 12, uh, 13, 14 to lead up to that, then that's what we have to get. So that is the, 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 is the art of compromise. And that sometimes is lost on people when they just so rigid and I want it all, or you're selling out if you don't get everything or you, you, you're not really a, a progressive if you if you're compromising with others. Now, mansion is just the opposite, you know, so that's a whole nother story. But when it comes to the second point that you're making about some of the progressives, too, that you mentioned, I didn't follow their races per se, but I do know that sometimes people will lose for a variety of reasons. And sometimes a person can go too far to the left and, and, and not be, you know, to the center. And that may turn off some people that are moderates and they say, hey, wait a minute, you're too extreme. Uh, it seems to be working for the right more when they go far, far to the right. It seems that helps them to, to win. But when it comes to the left, some like, for example, there are some people who say, hey, we don't need to see the squad. Uh, or if you align, you know, that's the AOC wing, the far, far left then that may scare some people. They're saying, hey, wait a minute, I may not want that. So the, the, there seems to be a, a movement to get to uh, uh, center, center left as, as opposed to far, far left. And that may be a reason yeah. why they lost their elections. But I tell people all the time that I'm a progressive, but I'm a pragmatist as well. I have these ideals that I think are, are good and noble. I want everyone to have access to healthcare. I think healthcare is a, is a, is a, is a right, not a privilege, right? Uh, and and it, it, we, we, we all should have those basic tenets. But I also understand that, you know, when you start talking about, you know, uh, uh, certain things, then they, then they say, well, you're trying to be a socialist. I understand that that doesn't work for everyone. So I think that we have to be very practical in our approach and incremental and sometimes you can take people too fast and, and really turn them off. So for me, that could be, uh, you have to maintain a healthy balance and you have to be able to willing to compromise. Again, everything yeah. goes back to compromise and a, a good candidate will listen to both sides and then they'll do what's in the best interest of the majority. And a lot of times that's making tough decisions. Yes, right. And, and a lot of times means we got to extend our hand to the other side and and figure out where, where compromise that compromise is. Not a dirty, it's not a bad word. Yes, right. 
In fact, uh, Lotus Hightower just said in the, tech, in the text, in the chat, excellent points, Mr. Reynolds. We must all make compromises for the situation to work. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we continue with our principles, but in terms of, as you said, incrementally moving forward, we have to find that common ground uh, among all Americans. I, I, I was told that I made a mistake by saying our party, uh, MPAC has to commit to a bipartisan, nonpartisan stance. So uh, it is the Democratic Party, but we all, you know, at this point, the, the attack uh, on our community is coming from one party uh, and one segment of that party, and that's the MAGA uh, Republicans. So it, it is it is important for us to make that clarification. However, listen, I want to thank all of you. We could have gone for like another two, three hours. And I, I, I saw that Mr. Holland's daughter joined the discussion just for a few minutes, really enjoyed seeing her uh, to uh, add to the beauty uh, of this uh, of this panel. Uh, you, you're all very, very high in stature. I hope to see you. I, I'm from California. I only wish we had one or more of you here in California to help us out, because uh, even though it's considered uh, safe, uh, you know, in terms of of our issues, in, in terms of elections and and uh, and and voter access and voter integrity, uh, it's still a big challenge uh, in, in California, like it is in in all the states. I hope it allows people to really appreciate our democracy more, and and actually drives them to get out to the uh, to the voting uh, booths, and we have high percentage voter turnout this year. We really need it. And I appreciate all the work that you've done, all three of you, in ensuring access to voting for all Americans. You're, you're all true champions for democracy and great Americans for that. So thank you very much uh, for this democracy forum. It's been very, very fruitful and successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Have a great day.